Um, is that... I actually think the presentation is also slightly cut off on the bottom, actually. At least for me, <coughs> there's a blip. Uh, the only thing you're missing out is that the photo with the date on it, so it's, it's not important. Oh, ah, okay. Okay. Oh, okay, I think I think it's working now, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think that, that presentation being cut off is is like uh, an issue on my end, but I can't fix it because right now I'm like focused on the presentation here. I'll, I'll fix it during one of the demos in a bit. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, but basically, the default state of this construct, so that or this 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 component, is that you have the body, which is largely filled with holes because it's the positively doped silicon. Although it has a few electrons floating around because and it's sort of a and it's not a perfect, perfectly positively charged material. Um, but there's not enough to really do anything. These few electrons are not enough to conduct a charge or anything. Um, and, and so... It went to the... There we go. And so, um, there's something interesting happens when you apply uh, an electric charge to the gate. So in this case, I'm placing a battery so that the positive terminal is connected to the gate, which causes it to become positively charged. Now, as I said earlier, in physics, things of opposite charges attract each other, so immediately those electrons are going to start moving towards the more positively charged gate, um, which also, at the same time, also causes the holes to be repelled uh, by the same charge. Um, and so eventually what ends up happening is this. Uh, all of the electrons are now aligned. They really want to get to that gate because it's positively charged, but they can't. There's an insulating material in between blocking them. Oh, we have something really interesting going on, which is that these electrons are basically forming a bridge between the two, between the two terminals on the left and the right. And so, because it's a free charge carrier, this is actually a medium for which electricity can now flow. And it, and it actually causes like a physical change in the actual material from P-doped to N-doped silicon. Um, and so you get this, this bridge which is uh, referred to as a channel, technically, and now you can have electricity flow. If you, of course, remove the battery again and let the gate discharge, um, the electrons will float away again and this will basically undo itself. Um, so that, that's also what's known as a, that also what is known as a um, N-channel MOSFET, because the channel ended up being made out of uh, N uh, negatively charged uh, silicon, but you can also get the opposite by simply swapping the two materials. You get a body filled with mostly electrons and of course now if you want to attract the holes to form a bridge you charge the gate negatively um, which causes holes to be attracted and form a channel of uh, p-dot silicon so this is known as a p, uh, p uh, channel uh, MOSFET and so the only difference between these two is what type of polarity you need uh, what type of charge you need to activate them this one requires a negative charge whereas the uh, n channel MOSFET required a positive charge on the gate and <laughs> and these are basically known as um, field effect transistors because, technically speaking, these uh, charge carriers, carriers are being manipulated by the electric field that falls between the gate and source, uh, similar to what would in a capacitor. And so CMOS is entirely built out of these two types of transistors, um, at least the, the logic cells are. And so and they're made out of complementary pairs, which looks like this. So this is a, a logic inverter. So if we say that um, a logic 1 is you know, positive voltage and a logic 0 is having the wire be connected to ground, and then this is a logic element that inverts that logic level. If you give it um, a, a positive input, it pulls the output to ground. If you pull the input to ground, it gives a positive output. It outputs a 0 for 1 or 1 for 0, which is the opposite of whatever the input is. And it is made out of exactly two types of transistors. And it has a P channel uh, at the top and has an N channel at the bottom. And I need to scroll for my presentation notes real quick. Yeah, and um, so let's, let's walk through the scenario real quick where the input is pulled to ground, which I'm signifying for the blue. And essentially this causes the top transistor um, to turn on, right? Because it's of, um, it's of a P channel, which means it needs a negative charge in order to switch on. So it switches on and it conducts the positive voltage to the output. That transistor at the bottom uh, is a is an N channel MOSFET, so it needs a positive charge to to switch, which is not present here, so it doesn't do anything. Um, however, the opposite, of course, is true when the input is, is high, when it's a logic one at the input, in which case it's the, the bottom transistor is the one that's active and the output gets gets pulled low. And so this is kind of what they mean with uh, complementary uh, in, in, in CMOS, um, is that there is always 
uh, two sets of transistors, each are trying to pull the output one way. And so this ends with the output always being driven either directly to the supply or directly to ground, um, which is very useful because it generates a strong signal that can be fed into further transistors or of the output of the chip. I'm not going to walk through this, um, but this is what a NAND gate looks like, which is a circuit with two inputs and one output. And you see the same thing, it's a little simplified here. You can see the same thing of having transistors trying to pull the output high and some transistors trying to pull the output low. And so you kind of get this, this, um, it, it, this, this complex interplay where the output is always driven one way or another. Uh, physically, um, this looks like this. So moving on from the, the schematic symbols now to a physical implementation. Um, this is what you would see if you were to take a cross section of an actual integrated circuit. Um, they look very similar to my to, to my graphics I showed earlier. Um, so down on the left you have the N-channel uh, transistor, and on the right you have the P-channel transistor. Um, the, the base material that the chip is made out of, also known as the substrate, is by default the uh, N-doped uh, silicon. So the PMOS transistor on the right doesn't need anything special there to afford its body. It just needs the, uh, the, the two wells for the, uh, the P-doped silicon. And the light on the left, you have the N-type N N transistor, which needs p dot silicon since base is kind of embedded in there. And, and as for the actual uh, wiring there, you can see, um, you can see the, the input and the output, um, and, uh, with, the, with the output being connected to the two drains of the transistor and the inputs just going to both gates. Um, and so this is kind of not uh, very well shown in here, is that the, the wiring, how the wiring works, um, it's actually very, very similar to PCBs. Um, you have to imagine it like, um, let me actually switch to the next slide already. Which looks like this. This is a 3D render of a chip that I, um, that I made before. If you, uh, now, now it's actually bad, it's getting cut off. Whatever. Um, at the very, at the very bottom, if you look very close, you can see the some red and uh, yellow, which is the actual uh, different types of silicons for the transistors, among other things. And above that, it's just a, a really large amount of wiring, just connecting all of the different transistors together. <clears throat> And so if it's very similar to a PCB, actually, in the sense that you have these traces going across with uh, vias dropping down vertically to make connections uh, on, the, on, the, on the Y axis. <clears throat> the, the, the funniest way to imagine it is if you have a four-layer printed circuit board and it has, that has nothing on it except SMD transistors, and you flip that around so the transistors, transistors are at the bottom, and you essentially get like a really, really crude model of what's going on inside an integrated circuit. Uh, yeah. And... And so, so this leads me directly into explaining what a uh, process development kit is, because um, this, this was been, I explained this a little bit in more abstract terms just now, the, the physical implementation, but in reality, um, it, it gets a lot more complicated. And there's many different ways to actually physically implement these structures and physically build these structures. So, and everyone does it a little bit differently. Every fab is a little differently. Um, they have different layer setups, um, because the way they construct these chips is layer by layer. Right, they start with the substrate with the transistors in it, and then the deposit material etch away where there isn't supposed to be any deposit etch, deposit etch, kind of literally stacking two on top of each other to build this chip. Um, but the setup for that can be wildly different. Um, the fabs also have different uh, capabilities when it comes to you know, what feature sizes they can produce. Um, and of course, um, they can also have different models. Um, that a transistor of a certain size from one fab may, be may behave completely differently than a transistor of the same size from a different fab, and so you kind of need models of that, if you, especially if you want to put analog circuitry. Um, and different standard cells as well, uh, defined by different PDKs, and I'll explain what standard cells are uh, after this bit. Um, and you, of course you need to describe all of these differences, all of these things, that's what the process design kit is, um, which is just all of these descriptions of how this fab does things. Um, and so, this, hold on. This is the layer stack diagram for, okay, you know what, I am actually going to fix the, the stream, this is annoying, it's getting cut off. I think it's my OPS acting up, let me check. Oh yeah, it's getting cut off in OBS here. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. 
but we can keep going now. Um, so basically, this is the layer stack diagram for the Skywater 130 nanometers um, uh, process development kit, uh, where you can see all the different um, metal layers up top, which is where the routing happens. Uh, you can see definitions of the VRs in the very, very bottom. You have where the actual transistors are. Um, so much of a chip is actually just routing. Um, and of course, you see all these different measures of how large or how, how tall these different features can be. And this is kind of and this is still a simplified diagram of what's actually going on. Um, to further document uh, the actual capabilities of the fab, they provide something called a design rule check or a set of design rule checks. If you ever used KiCad before to make PCBs, you know what these are. And roughly, it's just a series of rules and that you can't break when it comes to your feature sizes or distances between features. And so they have these for every single layer. Um, there's a lot of them. Um, and so. This is for the polysilicon layer, and you have a wall in there, for instance, width of poly, uh, 0.15 micrometers. Uh, um, and so you can't, you can't go, s so it's like, a, like, that's like a minimum size for that. I also need different simulation models. Um, I couldn't find a better screenshot of the software for some reason, and I couldn't get it to run. Um, but this is a software called XGEM, uh, which is being used to help with analog design uh, with the Skywater 130 PDK. Uh, you can see a very simple circuit going on there with, with some transistors. And it, this, simulator, uh, this, this uh, tool is capable of simulating your analog designs in great detail. It can even do things like factor in the temperature of the physical chip uh, when running the simulations. And so you really need very complex models uh, for that, how to make that happen. Those, of course, included with the uh, P PDK as well. And of course, one of one of the um, biggest things about the PDK is what standard cells it is. Um, and so, standard cells are kind of um, well. If you imagine building an integrated circuit for, say, a processor, right? You could theoretically go and individually place every single transistor and wire up individual transistors. But that would be quite tedious. There has to be, you know, some kind of basic modules implementing, implementing basic functions that you can chain together to make something more complex. Um, and anybody who's done, you know, logic design before is probably familiar with, uh, with logic gates. And those are a great start. Let's actually roll with that for a moment. So, because standard cells are supposed to be, you know, these um, basic modules of, you know, common functionality that's supposed to chain together. Logic gates seem pretty seem pretty reasonable because they can be used to implement any arbitrarily complex circuit. Um, so for this one, I'm going to actually switch now to my desktop. And I'm actually going to sit down because I can't use my keyboard otherwise. Okay. So there's this wonderful tool that I can use to actually uh, simulate these things, right? Um, it's called Logisim Evolution. Um, it looks about like this, and it lets me simulate um, logic uh, at like a higher level without having to worry about uh, physical implementation. And so, if I, I can play with this a little bit, of course. Um, so, once again, when I, when I uh, lay off abstraction higher, as I said, I'll be slowly going from the bottom up. So, once again, we're co continuing to roll with this definition from earlier, that we're considering ones to be like a positive voltage and then zeros to be ground. Um, so, while I'm going to play with this at like a more abstract level, just punching in ones and zeros, just be aware that we are still connecting this to an actual physical implementation using voltages. Uh, so, these abstract symbols from zero and one, so these are some common logic uh, gates which implement very simple functions on uh, binary bits of data. So this at the top is a AND gate, um, and I can individually toggle these, these inputs if I want to, and that's this output over there. And right now it's not doing anything, and that's because I turn both of these, these inputs high and the output turns on. Um, so AND gate, I'm pretty self-explanatory, and this is, this is what's known as an OR gate. So in this case, it doesn't matter which one I turn on, you can turn on both. And it's an exclusive OR gate. So once again, I can turn on either. But if I turn on both, it turns off again. So it's one or the other, but not both. And of course, I can I can have uh, I can have inverted versions of these as well. So if I just uh, delete this, delete no, oh not in edit mode. If I just delete this. I can actually replace it with a different type of gate if I want to. Which is great about this. And now I can now this is the same as the AND gate except the output is inverted. 
that's the opposite of what it usually would be. It turns off and goes on. And I can actually use these these very simple functions to uh, build more complex um, logic. So this down here, it's just using a handful of gates. It doesn't really look that complicated yet. But this is the minimum circuit that you need to be able to perform uh, addition. So it has three inputs and two outputs, and this circuit will essentially compute the sum of each of, of all of these inputs, so A plus B plus C. Um, so I put in a one, for instance. It's gonna it's gonna calculate one plus zero plus zero for me, which is one, which is one zero in binary. I can do this for any one of these. And of course, I can also input something like this, which is zero plus one plus one, which is two in binary, which is correct. Over here, zero one. That's uh, zero one binary. And if I turn on all three, I get three, um, which is one one in binary, which is correct. And of course, I can. You know, I, I, need you, I obviously want to do something more interesting than adding individual bits. Uh, so this down here is the same thing but duplicated, and I'm having kind of this feedback from one to the next. And now I can actually add two bit numbers. So if I click um, this and, and this, I'm now adding one plus two, which is three. That is correct over there. That's one one zero in binary. I can also do something like add three uh, plus one, which is four, which is zero zero one in binary. Which sounds correct. So. Well, with just a handful of gates, I'm now performing uh, correct addition, and I'm actually, <clears throat> and of course, I can now build even more complex arithmetic circuits on top of this, like multiplication, for instance, um, which is just a bunch of um, uh, additions chained together. And so, so if I just switch back real quick, and so. Yeah, okay, so standard cells are really just uh, the implementations of very, very basic logic functions um, uh, in these in these self-contained modules. So this is what one of them looks like, it's a 3D render. This is one of these standard cells from the Skywater 130 process development kit. And kind of see how it has um, some transistors in there, because you can see the two different the two silicon layers down there, <coughs> here and here. And of course, um, no, uh, this one is called Sky. Uh, 130 FD SCHD A210 underscore one, um, which means it is a uh, a two input or into the first input of a two input and. Um, so actually, this does not implement a single logic gate. The standard cell actually implements two. That's because there's some transistor level optimizations you can do, like reusing the output from a previous transistor for another logic gate. And so, oh, very very often, these standard cells have more than one actual gate inside of them. There's another fun one, this more top-down top view now, but this is a complete full adder inside a single cell. So this is a single standard cell implementing a full adder, and you can just paste this into your chip design and use it. And it's the point of these, they're implementing very, very basic functions, so they can just paste them into your design and wire them up in order to create more complex things. So I'm going to return to the demo now, because what I've shown so far was, example of, was examples of what is known as uh, combinatorial logic. And it basically means that the outputs of my circuit are only dependent on the inputs. I have the adder, for instance. If I input uh, the same numbers A and B, I know I'm always going to get the same result. Um, so my output only is only determined by my inputs, but it's not always what we want. Because at some point, you may want to consider, um, you know, storing data, um, because um, wouldn't it be great if you could actually remember stuff, <laughs> if, you could, if your computer could actually have some memory. And so there's some stuff you can do for that. Um, this, this, here's a, this here's a NOR gate, I've been showing before. It's just the inverse of an OR, turns off if your input is on. And so I have this kind of, this kind of interesting looking uh, construction down here of two OR gates. There's two inputs. Um, if I turn this one on, the output goes on. Right? If I if I turn it off again, the output it, it stays on. Um, even if I even if I turn this mic off, and if I turn this one the top on, the output goes off. Even if I turn it back off, so this is essentially a simple one-bit memory cell. It remembers exactly one bit of information. You can see that the two gates are kind of linked together to each other, kind of forming a feedback loop. And by um, by activating either one of these inputs, I'm changing the the exact nature of this feedback. And so, um, but it's not quite what we want. Like if I wanted to store the output of what's coming out of this uh, NOR gate, for instance, it's not outputting you know, two signals, outputting one, it's outputting one bit. That needs to be, that needs to be um, made simpler somehow. So this, this is that. Uh, it once again has just uh, two inputs, but sometimes it works a little bit differently. If I mess with either one, 
and nothing seems to happen, I just leave this one on and then turn this one on, uh, the output changes. Um, so essentially what's happening here is I have my data input at the top, I turn it off and I can pause this. And this here is the actual um, enable, which actually triggers the, the outputs to be saved, uh, the input to be saved, sorry. And, and um, so I can actually decide when I want to actually store this information as well. well that's one issue with this. If I leave this on, um, and then, you know, and just start messing with this, it updates. So it, it updates the output for as long as this is high. Only when it goes low is the output actually saved. Um, and, but that's not, maybe, not, maybe not what you want. Um, maybe if you have some experience with working with embedded systems, or just in general with networking, um, that you might see this as kind of bad. Um, you, you always like in computer science to synchronize things to like one specific instance in time between um, maybe maybe different clients in a network or between different components in a circuit. And so you, you kind of don't want this behavior. You kind of want one defined instant in time where you store your data. And so, so this is a little large. I didn't realize it would fit on screen here. But um, so it's a little bit more complex now, um, but still just building on, on this kind of feed, feedback loop between gates. Um, I think this is the other way around. Yep, so once again, I have my data input and I have my enable. If I tick the enable, the output, uh, the output changes. So, but now I'm gonna leave the enable on, and I'm gonna change the data input. Uh, but the output, it still didn't change. Um, so this circuit is special in that it doesn't store data as long as the signal is high, it stores it when it changes. So as soon as this signal, this, this clock signal changes from, uh, from a zero to a one, um, will it actually change the output? Uh, so it's the transition of this, of this clock, um, of, this, of the signal from zero to one that actually does the, that actually triggers this, this data to be saved. Um, what happened to my full body? Anyway, I'm almost done. I'll get back up in a moment. And of course, and this is this is a very common component known as a D flip flop. Um, and this is its schematic symbol. So you have the data input at the, at, at the top. I can input my data, and you have this input at the bottom called the clock. And whenever I whenever the clock goes from low to high, the value on data gets stored. I just realized that I haven't been um, very careful about the the stream delay, so I apologize if that was uh, maybe a little bit confusing. Um, but of course, let me, let me get up. Let me actually get up. Because my, my full body broke. Ah. Things just, just things just do not want to not be scuffed today. Okay. Anyway, so continuing on with the, the actual presentation now. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Um, so, so this is what's known as a D flip flop. This kind of way of, of storing just a single bit of data, and of course you can chain them to get uh, to get larger sizes. And um, this is another standard cell. It's a Sky 130 FDSCH DFXTP, uh, which is just a type of flip flop. And they're big. Um, you really want to be careful when designing chips about not having too many uh, flip flops because they really take up uh, a lot more space than, than combinatorial logic. And so, so the implications of this actually are quite interesting as well, um, because if they basically consider that, um, wait, what the hell? Okay, I'm not at the site I thought I was. Sorry. Uh, yeah, my notes are incorrect. Okay, so let's just move on. Um, so let, let's consider this very uh, simple example circuit here. So. This is a single D flip flop, um, and the output of it is actually not. It's actually going into this gate, and it's basically taking that gate, its output, and feeding it back into the data input of the D flip flop. So essentially, every single time the clock pulses, it's going to update the value inside the flip flop with this this computation being performed by the the XOR gate. Um, I do want, I would like to point out that. Um, 
this um, XOR gate in this example kind of just stands for more complex logic. Usually you wouldn't have something this simple in the circuit. You'd have like entire adders or entire like larger computations um, in between in between here. But I'm just using a single exclusive OR gate for simplification. But essentially, um, what this does is on, on every single um, signal, a uh, rising edge on the clock input of the flip-flop, on every single transition, it's going to update the contents with whatever's going on with the, with the XOR gate. Um, so, and that, let's, let's just walk through that. Um, so, this is kind of the, the, the default state of the, of the system, let's just say. We start out like this. So, the, the value in the flip-flop is a 1, uh, but the input, the input at the top is also a 1, so the XOR gate is actually outputting 0. So, the next time the clock pulses, you kind of, you know, ordinarily you would expect okay, the next state of this is going to be a zero. It's going to update the contents of the flip-flop with a zero. Um, but instead, something something else happens. So the output of the flip-flop updates, um, but the output of the XOR gate, it doesn't update right away. Um, and that's because you have to imagine that because switching a transistor is a physical process of waiting for charge carriers to move around, it takes time. It's not an instantaneous process of teleportation um, on part of those of those charge carriers, those electrons or those holes. Um, it takes a while. It takes a while for the channel to form. It takes a while for the transistor to fully turn on. And of course, if the output of this transistor is fed into the input of another, the, the second transistor has to wait for the output of the one before it to rise. And so you kind of create these delays. Um, it takes some time for the XOR gate to update its output. So that's what you're seeing here. I'm kind of indicating that if it's here, even though with these two inputs of 0 and 1, the output of the gate should also be a 1, it's still processing, right? And this is what I'm saying. It's waiting for its transistors to switch and its outputs uh, to update, um, which is fine. Um, eventually, it's going to finish, and it's going to present the next value to the flip-flop. Um, but instead, we're, we're going to consider this scenario, and that's the next clock pulse arrives. Um, the next clock pulse arrives too early. Right, the inputs, the, the, the clock input to the flip-flop, it, it, it rises again before the XOR gate is done processing and updating its output. And now the situation gets worse because now the flip-flop, it's also made out of transistors that need to switch. So now it starts to, it, it starts processing its own inputs and that, that starts taking a while. Um, so it's out, its output doesn't update immediately as well. And now right in the middle of it doing that, the, the XOR gate, it finally decides it's finished. Um, um, and its output becomes present, and now we're right in the middle of the D flip flop still changing states. Um, it's providing the updated output. So what, what's going on here? Um, what, what's going to happen now? Is the flip flop going to um, output a one or a zero of this? I mean, it received both a zero and a one on its input during the entire time, and it was trying to switch. So what happens now? Um, it, nobody knows. Um, basically, the flip flop in this state will. Have behave extremely erratically. Um, it will switch to a completely random state now. And this is known what is this what is known as a timing violation. You're basically you're basically not providing uh, you're basically not giving the circuit enough time to actually settle before you try and update its state again. And so here's something that's that's maybe a little bit more realistic to occur in an, in a in a in a real circuit. You have two flip flops. Uh, one of them is used to buffer an input and then its output is fed through uh, some gates that do some computation, and then the output is fed into another flip-flop that stores the result. <clears throat> so on every every um, rising clock edge there, you're essentially updating the input, storing the result of the previous computation. It's kind of this chain of values flowing through the circuit from left to right, um, kind of doing processing, um, which has this interesting implication that... Um, because this is all that's happening in, in, in a processor. Like even the one that's, that's running VR right now, it's just a bunch of latches with logic in between. And the only thing that that clock does, that like 5 gigahertz or whatever clock on your processor does, is determine the speed at which uh, the results get stored. Uh, so the interesting implication there is that the actual computations in your computer, they happen in between those clock pulses continuously and not, uh, not like actually synchronized to the clock. And the only thing that's getting synchronized is uh, storing results. But uh, we, we can actually replicate a time violation here as well. Uh, because once again, in this scenario too, uh, if the clock arrives before the middle part is done processing, um, you know, because this takes sometimes two gates, it takes even longer. And so if, if, there are two, if there are two clock pulses back to back arriving way too fast, um, then the second latch on the right is going to try latching before the data is, is, is available. And <clears throat> And so um, there's multiple different times of time, time, types of time violations you can get. Um, uh, there is a set of time violations, whole time violations. Um, you also have to 
actually compute the propagation delay you're dealing with, and you have to make sure that the clock itself has a certain pulse switch that can't just be like like a single instant. Um, so this is what a time diagram for a flip flop might look like. Um, so this is kind of just this is kind of just showing the different electrical signals in a circuit. Um, so we're going back to to um, actually electricity now. At the top, you have the clock input to the flip-flop. In the middle, you have the data input to the flip-flop. And on the very bottom, you have the, the output of the flip-flop. It's kind of confusingly annotated, so I'm going to highlight some sections here. Uh, this, the first one here is the, um, is the data setup time. Right? There's a minimum amount of time that the data input needs to be stable for before the clock goes high. Then you have the you have the um, data hold time after the clock goes high. You need to make sure that the data stays stable for some amount of time. And then you have the, the propagation delay. How long does it take for the output to update? And um, <clears throat> it, it seems maybe a little bit arbitrary for me to explain these, these, this concept specifically, but when you're building chips, right, even at the high level, even if you're dealing with barrel log, this is something you need to watch out for. Um, timing violations is one of the most common things you will run into. I know that when I started making... Um, um, chips. I would. I. I wish I would have known about all of this because it, it it messed up my early designs pretty bad. Um, because even when you're working in like high level systems, uh, like like log, these things can still happen if you if you write too complex scenarios. Right. So an example of this might be this. Um. So, imagine you're building a processor and you you've verified it can run at uh, 10 megahertz, right? It's completely fine with a 10 megahertz click si clock signal, there's no violations. But then you try and implement a multiply instruction into it, and suddenly you get timing violations. It turns out the multiply instruction does not finish in time for the next clock cycle because it's a really, really complicated operation. And I can't really implement an entire multiplier, uh, not just an evolution real quick, so just have four OR gates to kind of simplify really complex operation happening between two steps. And so there's multiple different ways you can solve this. Uh, for one example, would be to just slow down the clock, just go below 10 megahertz, but then you're kind of cutting performance for like your whole processor. Another thing you can do is to split up the operation. So this is the exact same thing as before, except there is, a, there is an additional D flip flop in the middle to buffer one of the intermediary results. The effect of this is that it now takes three clock cycles to completely process the input instead of just two, but the amount of logic between the flip-flops has halved. So now you can run at the original 10 megahertz clock speed, um, and all of the instructions will run at their, their original intended speed, except multiply, which will be half as fast as being originally intended. Maybe that's a, tra maybe that's a trade-off you want to make. Um, <clears throat> but um, now comes the part of the presentation where I basically just... Um, I basically just um, explain how um, you don't really need to deal much at all with uh, manual replacing logic, and instead there's some uh, there's a way more elegant way um, of doing that. Because even even asking people to actually manually come up with logic circuits to implement entire CPUs, especially something as complicated as like x86, x86 is kind of unreasonable. Um, so people came up with this beautiful, beautiful thing called a hardware description language, which is a way to present your hardware that you want to build um, using the, this code-like syntax, but it actually turns into, into hardware. <clears throat> so this is the one that's used by Skywater. It is, it's Verilog. Um, it, looks, it looks like C, right? It, it looks kind of C with some, some different syntax, like you don't have curly braces, you have a begin and end. Um, and the assignments are arrows instead of just equal signs, but it, it looks almost like C, uh, but it's not C. In fact, this is not a software programming language. Um, you cannot compile this into software. Right? Instead, this is code that will compile into physical hardware circuits uh, using a tool called a synthesizer. And so this is a way of representing um, hardware at a very, very high level. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, for instance, say you wanted to implement a NAND gate, right? Uh, in, in a, a gate that uh, turns off if both its inputs are on, well, you just type this. Um, wire is a keyboard that means a, literally a wire. And so this looks like a variable definition. It's sort of this. Um, you're defining a, a wire in your physical circuit. that's sort of the data type. Um, and you're taking two inputs <clears throat> and doing some some um, logic operations on them like you would in, in Booleans uh, in, in regular programming languages. And this will actually turn into a NAND gate in your physical design if you pass it to a synthesizer. 
Um, and of course, um, if you wanted to have a full adder, um, like I showed earlier, um, you could just implement it like that. Instead, um, this entire circuit basically just boils down to um, two lines of code. It's not easier to understand. Uh, so in this case, I just took off the individual logic gates. Um, I mean, you could optimize this further, but uh, the synthesizer does have some optimizations built into it. Um, but of course, um, you can also just do this because um, Verilog has um, adi an addition primitive that will generate a full adder for you. Uh, so you don't actually, so you don't actually need to deal with that. Um, <clears throat> and um, there was a little bit of uh, new syntax there. If there, if there, um, braces there of the one and zero uh, in between, which is. Um, which means that this is not one wire, it's multiple. Um, because what if you want to define larger data types, right? Because a wire is just a single bit. It's just a single wire, it's a single bit. But if you had like an 8-bit bus, for instance, you wouldn't want to define eight individual wires. In this case, a 32-bit bus even. So instead, um, this is basically just a syntax to say, hey, I want multiple wires generated and assign them this uh, this, this, this symbol, this name, uh, R0. Um, and uh, um, the, the syntax of this is just in an in, in inclusive range. So this is 0 for 31 inclusive, which is a total of 32 elements. Um, you can define uh, the flip-flops, of, of course, as well, uh, using the reg keyboard. Um, so what you're seeing is just defining a flip-flop and then assigning its value. So assigning a 1 to it is just one bit. Um, but of course, uh, the flip-flops have a clock input, right? You need to know when to actually trigger this load. Um, and so this, this is what that syntax is. Um, uh, always at post search clock. In this case, you're kind of telling it that everything inside this block should use this clock signal. Um, so you have the assignment is now valid. So this will, unlike the previous snippet of code, which would uh, give a compiler error, this will actually um, this will actually turn into a single D flip flop latching the inverted value of in zero. Uh, you can have ifs as well, <coughs> which seems a little bit strange. Um, uh, to have that, how does if uh, turn into hardware? Uh, so, I wanted to explain, let me return to my couch real quick. <laughs> okay. It seems I let go of the microphone during the last demo. If I do that again, could somebody just uh, tell me? That would be nice, I think. Okay, so, okay, then. Uh, I think some people in the, in the back might not actually hear me. Um, let's see if I find the right one. Okay, so, um, there's one logic component I've yet to uh, introduce. Uh, it's this, the top here. Um, it's called a, a MUX. Um, and so it has three inputs, uh, but they kind of, kind of arrange it like that, with one at the, at the bottom. Uh, if I turn on this, if I mess up this top input, just whatever appears at the top, it just goes to the output. The bottom one appears to not do anything. And this, of course, I turn on this input, the bottom. You have to forgive the stream delay once again. If I turn on this input at the bottom, then suddenly whatever's at the bottom input here will transition to the output. If I turn the bottom, bottom input off again, then whatever's at the top here gets transitioned to the output. So <coughs> a mux just selects between two signals. I have this one bit input that selects between two inputs. But of course, um, you can implement this entirely using um, standard logic gates as well if you wanted to, because if anything can be implemented in standard logic gates. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a very simple way to choose between two different values. Uh, so going back to the if here, essentially what this, what this piece of code will do is it will generate, um, is it will generate a multiplexer that selects uh, between um, these two different cases. So you have two different options for what you want to load into DFF, that being 0 and 1, and you're selecting between them based on this comparison at the top. <clears throat> and you can run a comparison in logic very simply using uh, AND gates to check equality, because AND gates essentially check equality. Um, and so, oh my god, I left my mouse behind. Um, and so, of course, you can nest these as well. Uh, so here's an example of unlisted ifs, but that's also very easy uh, to turn to hardware because you're just um, expanding how many different things you're selecting from. And so even even really really complex code can be can be really decomposed into these very simple components. So looking at an actual example from a chip I actually taped out, um, this is a, a very simple block uh, to understand. 
you have this condition that wraps everything that's checking that um, this clock diff, which is a register, which is a, a, a series of flip-flops, <clears throat> is not equal to a specific value. If it's not, it increments a counter, checks if the counter is equal to another another variable. Um, if, if it is, then resets the counter and uh, does some other stuff. So essentially, this um, this will... Um, this will update its internal state every n clock cycles, or whatever happens to be the current value of this uh, clock diff, very appropriately named clock diff uh, setting. Um, and so that, there's a couple of things that, uh, that you need to keep in mind though when walking a barrel lock, because you can't treat it like a programming language. You really have to get into your headspace, hey, I'm making hardware. I'm not writing a program. So because a programmer might look at this, Right, um, and it, it might think, wait, D is kind of redundant because D uh, will always be the same value as C. Right, you're setting C to something, but then you're setting D to C, so isn't D always the same as C? Uh, but that's actually false <clears throat> because this barrel lock will generate into uh, this circuitry right here, which has two flip flops, um, and you can see the you can, can kind of see the output of the top flip flop, um, which is C in our example, um, is being being routed down to the input of the second flip-flop, which is D, but their clock signals are the same, right? So they get assigned, um, they, they get latched at the exact same instant. So what's really happening here um, is because they're both receiving the same clock signal, and the clock signals time uh, sort of assignments to, to these D flip-flops. What's actually happening here is that these assignments to C and D happen at the exact same time. These are in parallel, because that's how hardware works. Your different hardware components, your different parts of your hardware, are going to operate in parallel. And so, what's actually happening here is that D will hold the previous value of C after every clock cycle. Of course, you can, can avoid this confusion by actually naming your variables properly. Please do that. So, we've discussed there a lot. Uh, we've discussed uh, standard cells and logic gates, uh, but we're still missing a link. Right, because Paralox sounds nice, and um, when it comes to, you know, it has this thing you can, you can turn to hardware, but when you pause to think about it, how do you actually do that? How do you go from something as simple as code, something as complex as hardware with all of the routing, especially with the render I showed earlier, so it's like, it's just a heap of wires. Um, it sounds kind of complicated, and it is. Um, so um, the people over at Skywater and Ethablets, they came up with this thing called OpenLane. It is the very first open source, it's not the first, but it's the very first open source um, uh, flow, is what they call it, for generating production-ready designs direct, directly out of Verilog uh, code. So it, it, it's a whole bunch of different programs. So this, this isn't like a single algorithm. Every single box in this flowchart is its own separate program. Right? So you, you, the, the data essentially gets passed through this entire chain of different softwares in order to arrive at the final result. Um, some of this is stuff that eFabless make themselves, and then open source and some of it is existing open source tools. I'm not going to go through everything because we would be here all day. But I'm going to highlight the, the most important aspects. Right? So the very, very first thing that happens when you call the opening flow in a design you've made is it um, it does it, it oh, hold on. It does the synthesis. Um, it uses a tool called Yosis, um, which is an open source uh, parallel synthesizer. And Yosis is a very, very smart tool. It's usually used with FPGAs um, in order to generate the lookup table uh, configuration and stuff from Verilog. But you can also pass it a list of standard cells to my process development kit, and it will try and implement your Verilog code as a series of, or as a net of standard cells from my process development kit. So essentially the output of this, um, but it's not directly hardware. You have to think of it like when you go to, to actually draw up a schematic of a circuit you want to build physically, you know, kind of open up your notebook or open up KiCad and stuff like drawing up the schematic diagram, but it's very abstract. Right? The schematic diagram only just shows you know, what is supposed to be connect, uh, connected to what. You're not, you're not actually giving any details about how this should physically look like. Um, <clears throat> so that's what Yosis does. So now comes the heavy lifting part of actually taking this, the, this circuit description and turning it into a, an actual layout. Um, so the first step is called floor planning. Right? So um, assuming you have a limited die area you want to walk with, say 500 by 500 micrometers, um, it would be helpful to have some guides in there. Um, so um, 
yeah, that's what floor planning is. It's literally just generating a grid of guides that will be used in the next step in order to align components to, to a fixed grid, make things a little bit cleaner, cleaner and easier to work with. It also places the IO pins, because if you're making a chip, you also want to talk to the outside. And so it needs to have connections that don't go to other parts of the chip, but out of it. Um, those need to be placed. Um, and you also need to... You know, so if you need to place any larger building blocks, because um, on top of having standard cells, it's actually possible for the user to define their uh, own custom macros of logic, um, which also need to be placed. Um, and of course, it generates the, the power grid, um, which is literally a grid of wires uh, bringing power into the chip. Um, and power wires are handled separately in the chip because they, they work separately in actual like, data signals, of course. Um, the next step is... Um, clock tree synthesis, um, which exists to solve the problem is that the clock needs to be ultra low latency. As I said, the clock's purpose is it to synchronize all of the D flip flops in your system. And because of the like different timing violations, ideally you want the clock to arrive at every single flip flop at the exact same time. Now that's impossible, right? It takes a signal some time to travel through this wire. Um, it takes it some time, and the thing is, the signal also degrades as it travels through this wire, so we may need buffers uh, to to repeat it. But those also add delay, and so really want the shortest possible wire length for the clock signal specifically. Nothing else matters. So it generates something called a clock tree. Um, which isn't any actual routing yet, it's sort of just a set of guides. And apparently this is the most efficient way to route a clock, and to route a clock signal on the chip. And it's, it's the king of all, of all signals on a chip. It's, it's, it's the most important one, and it gets treated specially. Um, next comes the actual fun part, which is placement. So now um, it's actually taking the standard cells, or this list of standard cells that your design needs to have, and it's actually placing them on the, on the chip. It's actually putting them on a chip, um, similar to how if you like actually went to build a piece of like hardware on a breadboard, it would actually place down your components now after you've designed your schematic. And of course, um, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, it starts with the gate level map list, starts with the, the schematic, and it actually places these specific um, <clears throat> standard cells according to the grid. Now, of course, it, this happens in two steps, global and detailed. Um, the very first thing it does is it places these cells in the most optimal pattern possible, and it does not care about the laws of physics. It will literally clip these inside each other um, in an effort to achieve the most optimal placement. Um, of course, this is not manufacturable. Um, you'd have to like manufacture your chip into the fourth dimension or something to make this. Um, <clears throat> so instead, um, it goes into the next step, which is detailed placement, which is taking the output of global placement and shifting things around just slightly until it actually works out. So this creates a balance between actually being manufacturable and having efficient placement. And now comes the, the most fun step, um, for me at least, uh, for my computer at least, um, routing, right? Because, um, because now it comes the part where you actually wire things up. You've placed your components, you have your schematic, now you're actually gonna take out your wires and connect the components physically together. Um, this, is, <clears throat> this is very, very, very complicated. If anybody has used KiCad before and used one of the auto routers available to, to create a route in your design, you, you may know it can take like a minute or two to route to like 200, 300 nets in your design. And now imagine having to deal with hundreds of thousands or even over a million nets. And that is a job that the auto router needs to have in open lane. And, and this is also done in two steps, global routing, which generates rough guides of how things should be connected. Once again, just trying, to, once again, with, with the breaking the laws of physics thing, like can phase through things. And then detailed routing, actually fixing up the wiring, making things um, um, pass DRC. It, it needs to be aware of the design rules the entire time to make sure it doesn't break those either. This step can really take a long time. Um, on a large design, it can take hours, and it's the only step in the entire open lane flow that's multi-threaded. So it will pin your CPU at 100% for like three hours straight. Um, <clears throat> it's great. Um, the next, and then finally, does a timing analysis um, because, as I said, there's these timing violations, and if you have those in your physical design, it will break. It will not work. Um, things will just start uh, freaking out. As I said earlier, the flip flops will not know what to do, um, and so. <clears throat> you can actually automatically check for these. Um, it actually runs these tests three times. I mean, it goes over your design and checks you know, different wire, different connections. It, it kind of simulates things a little bit. Um, 
it, it runs this three times because the, the performance of the flip flops can actually depend on things like voltage and temperature. So there's like diff, there's like a whole spectrum of, of different performance characteristics that need to be analyzed. And finally, you have design rule check. Right. For one final time, it looks at design rule check rules, goes over the entire design, and makes sure absolutely nothing violates the design rules. And now it can finally. Oh my god, no, that's one more step. Um, it, um, it runs something called LVS, which is another DLC step. It's called Layout First Schematic. Now, usually this is used in analog designs, because if you're making analog, there is no automated flow. You actually do have to go in and manually place transistors, manually route things up in a layout editor. Um, and LVS is kind of meant for that, where you take the layout you've designed, you compare it against the schematic that you're trying to replicate, and if they don't exactly match up, you get an error. In this case, it's just a sanity check because both the schematic and the layout and open main were both automatically generated. So it's checking checking its automatically generated output versus its um, later stage automatically generated output. It's a sanity check. Right. Now it can finally oh, I mean too far. Um, now it can finally generate the actual output. It generates something called a GDSI file, um, which is uh, the file you actually send to the fab that contains the masking information for making your chip. Um, it's kind of like Gerber files for PCBs like way more advanced and yeah um, that is kind of the final step here you can see um, at the top left of this diagram you can see the, the yellow file icons it's the that's the actual like source download going in on the bottom right you get one output which is the um, the GDSI file that you sent to the fab for manufacturing so <clears throat> Obviously, as I said, I skipped over a lot. Um, there's a lot of things I didn't get into, um, um, stuff like CTS or SDA, um, because simply uh, it would be here all day. <laughs> um, so, who wants to see me actually do this? Who wants to see me actually make a chip? Um, yeah, it's demo time. So let me just sit down again. Yeah. Now, hopefully, this will actually work. Because it may seem it may seem kind of scary, uh, both me talking about you know MOSFETs and then and logic design. Maybe most of it is just um, required knowledge for understanding things like like timing violations. Um, you, even there, I skipped over a lot of things that you don't don't necessarily need to know. Okay, so I want to make a chip, right? So let's actually let's actually CD to the correct directory. There is this beautiful repository in GitHub. It's called Caravel User Project, and it is a a project that has already been set up for you with all of the files you need to actually get started with open lane and, and making your own designs. And the goal of this is that you end up with something that you can actually submit to the open shuttles um, or maybe one of the paid shuttles as well. <clears throat> but people use this to actually make designs for the open shuttles, for the free shuttles and actually get their design made, designs made in the end. Um, so that's what it looks like when you first uh, clone it. It's, it appears to have a lot of stuff in it, but most of this is just default settings and stuff already provided to you, or outputs um, of, of, the, of the open lane flow. And um, this, ah, I accidentally clicked away. So obviously all of, the, all of the magic happens in this uh, folder called uh, Verilog, conveniently. So if you go inside there and inside RTL, this is where you can drop your uh, Verilog files for what you want to make. So in my case, uh, I'm not actually going to code anything complex live, uh, but I have this file right here that has a implementation of a very, very simple 8-bit microprocessor. Um, it's a replica of the CDP-1802, which is uh, which is a very, very um, brisk CPU. Um, so it, it's only like four, 500 lines long, um, and a lot of it is just indentation. So, and you can see that the implementation is a gigantic uh, chain of else ifs implementing these different instructions. So very simple CPU design made in, made in Verilog. Uh, so we want to turn this into an actual chip. So let's actually look at how to do that. Um, so first things first, Fine. We need a build config for it. So there's this folder called open lane. You go inside, and this is where your build configs are. Um, so I already created one. It's called AS1802. Um, I guess there have a lot of files, and this is not supposed to be here yet. Um, so the good thing is, is that most of these files are basically provided to you. Now, even if I open up this config.json, 
um, it, it looks very complicated inside, but literally all of this is default settings. Um, you can literally just get this file from the example project that's included when you clone the repository for the first time. <clears throat> the only thing that I changed is I, I, I up here I defined the, the name of the design um, to be whatever the module name I use in the Verilog code. And then I, of course, listed the Verilog source files in my team. And then the only thing you need to further modify is you know, tell it the name of the, the wire in your design that is supposed to be used for the clock uh, because it needs to you know, special case the clock so it needs to know which wire it is. <clears throat> Just put in its name here. Um, and here you can adjust the area of the, of the die. So I've had, I've had set to 500 uh, by 500 micrometers. And now you're ready to go. Um, after just dropping in a file and changing some strings in a config, you're ready to run make uh, AS1802, whatever your design name is, and you can get started. So this seems like would be the part where I have to tell you you need to install like a million different pieces of software, but no. The only required packages that you need for this is Python 3 and Docker. Um, and I guess make to um, the entire thing downloads as a, and runs as a Docker container. So you don't need to worry about managing different pieces of software. Software is maybe different versions. You just need Docker. And the entire thing is very, very streamlined. Just run, just pulls the Docker container the first time you run this. Don't you run this? <coughs> okay. <coughs> so it's, it's still in step one right now, which is uh, running, uh, running the synthesis, uh, taking the a Verilog and turning it into a standard cell net list. Um, this is going to take just a minute. Uh, it could be worse. I've had this step take up to two hours before as well. It's not multi threaded either, which doesn't help. Mm. There we go. It's already doing some timing analysis, um, floor planning, IO placement. Yeah, there's a bunch more steps in what I explained, but I said I did also some awesome things. Some of these steps are also context dependent. It sometimes skips over some of these depending on the context of, uh, of the build. And uh, now it's done doing a placement. That is on my screen. <coughs> and um, it's now running the, the clock tree synthesis. And after it's done doing the clock tree synthesis, it's going to start doing a uh, routing. So at this point, and because the routing is actually going to take a minute, uh, I would like to take a moment to explain how to actually test your design. Because, you know, as I said, once you submit something to the fab, you can't exactly tell them at any point in time, like, hey, can you update my design? And I found a bug in my design. Um, you can't do that. So you really, really need to be sure that it works beforehand. Um, having an FPGA to help things with helps, but FPGAs can behave very, very differently from actual hardware. And so instead, uh, you simulate your design. And so the simulation tools, hold on, get some water. The simulation tools are also included in this repository. If you go into this different folder on here, DV, this is where you can define um, unit tests, which will then be run in a simulation. A very simple one here called CPU tests. Uh, most of this, most of this has uh, generated outputs. <coughs> the only thing you need to worry about is the test bench file. So the test benches that you write are also defined in Verilog. I don't know why. Verilog is not a programming language, but for some reason you need to define your test benches in Verilog um, instead of an actual programming language. It's kind of strange. Uh, but the way test benches work is you provide a set of inputs or series of inputs to your design, and you check the outputs. Uh, so this looks very long once again, but most of this is once again just taken from the example project. Now uh, this in here is kind of the meat um, of the test. Um, um, at the very top, I, um, you know, I'm checking first of all that the thing can execute instructions at all. I send it a no op, and then for every single clock cycle, I check that the specific conditions on the different uh, outputs of the chip are met. Um, and if that's okay, um, I execute this uh, complete instruction sequence. So I have to execute this short program where it loads some immediate values set up in the register with an address. It does some arithmetic and then executes a store instruction. And what this store instruction does is essentially the criteria for if this test passes or not. Um, so get, get some instruction execution in there, and at the very end, once again, it's a very detailed check of, of, of this final instruction being executed. So naturally, you would actually want to write way more complex tests for this, for something um, if you actually wanted to submit something, but this is simple enough to show. And I already know this design works because I have written complete tests for it. Um, 
end of a project. Um, so, looking back at the build, it seems to have finally finished with detailed routing. It was all the way back here. And it's now actually performing the timing analysis uh, one, one bit at a time. So, I know it's at max process call. It's at, it's at two out of three. <coughs> This one actually still take another moment. Um, I'm actually doing better on time than I thought I was. <laughs> um, Uh, yeah, no, I'm supposed to be talking at this point. Yeah, ah, there we go. Okay, so it's uh, finally done doing all the timing analysis, and it can now finally actually stream out the um, GDSI file, which means we'll be able to look at it soon. Um, hey, um, Gio, is it okay if I uh, restart the stream? Because I've just realized I forgot to increase the, the bitrate, and I know that's going to mess up in a moment. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's all fine. I guess I can adjust it live, I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna literally just double it. Stop. Start. <clears throat> okay, I just did stop and start. <clears throat> Can you put your URL again? Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, okay. Hey, we should now be running using a higher bitrate. Um, so in the meantime, um, it has actually finished uh, with exporting stuff. It's running LVS, it's running uh, the design will check. Actually, now that this is no longer hitting my, my CPU of 100%, um, let me actually... Okay, there we go. Oh, come on. What's happening to my controller? Tracking is like really bad on my couch right now. So, okay, there we go, I'm back. So while this um, is running, let me, let me just tell you about um, how this is actually submitted. Because right now, what we're building is not actually a complete uh, chip design, it's a macro. As I said, you can define custom logic blocks um, macros, which work the exact same as you, as you might imagine uh, macros to work. And, and maybe, maybe in like C, for instance, we can just copy-paste them in. Um, <clears throat> the reason for this is that you really want to make ev every design that you want in its own like macro at the topmost level. Um, so the reason for that is that when you submit something to eFabless, they don't directly make it. Um, they embed it in something called a, called a Caraval. Um, so essentially, um, this is the chip you're actually getting there on the right, and it says uh, users project uh, 10 square millimeters. So this is where whatever you submit them will be put. Um, you'll have 10 square millimeters of space. That's a little less, I think, actually. <coughs> But you see that blob at the bottom there? That's the management controller. Essentially, they are embedding an entire microcontroller you know, with GPIOs and timers and SPI and a UART um, into your design. And the purpose of it is that it, on top of those peripherals, it also has logic analyzer probes and a wishbone debug bus. It can probe signals from inside your design so it can be used for debugging. Essentially, you want to be able to verify that your design, that your chip works um, before you build complex hardware around it. And that's why you embed an entire microcontroller at the bottom of your chip so that you can run automated tests in place, make sure everything works on a test bench without co connecting much complex hardware. And then you can actually go and make your complex PCBs or hardware setups for your chip and, and, and deploy it. Um, and so, I think it's the end of the bus. Hey, finished. So the flow is completed, and the design just passed uh, design rule checks. So now I can actually open this in K layout, uh, which is a layout editor tool, an optional install in this case. So let's take a look. 
let's open the GDS file and see what it looks like. Yeah, this is why I wanted higher bitrate, by the way. So it looks kind of it looks like kind of a cube by default. So I've got to load this uh, AI properties file. There it is. This is essentially what we've just created, and it, it I can hide some of the some of these um, uh, decap capacitor cells to actually it actually take a take a better look at it. It also inserts fill cells for any unused spaces. There we go, perfect. <clears throat> now you can actually see this big like old warp that our that, that the design turned into. Um, if I, if I zoom in, you can see the actual standard cells are very neatly arranged. So they are actually in this kind of like grid-like pattern, and you can and the actual routing as well on top of them connecting them all. And this was all automatically generated just on those on those uh, 400 lines of Verilog code um, without any any human intervention, which I think is beautiful. If you wanted to you know, iterate on a design, um, you could now update your Verilog and just run this again. And of course, if you wanted to actually generate the full uh, caravel with your chip inside it, because right now it's just built a macro, um, you would actually have to execute another target, which is make uh, make user project wrapper, which, by the way, I'm not going to run. Um, this, this can actually take a really, really long time, so I'm not going to do that. Um, and of course, um, once I have my chip built, I can also run a simulation of it. So make verify CPU test. And this is going to run a simulation of the design, which is going to go by a lot faster, I promise. <clears throat> it, it's uh, it's going to take a moment to even start up, because it is simulating the entire caravel, including that uh, management controller, including the microcontroller. And so right now, I'm just it's, it's, it has to actually wait for the microcontroller to boot up and initialize the IOs before it can begin the actual test sequence. There it is. So the tests have passed, obviously, um, but I can actually look at specifically what happened during that simulation if I go to the DB CPU test and in this file. There's a tool called GTK Wave, which just means you inspect uh, what's going on inside the design. Um, so I can pull up a couple signals from the chip here. So let's pull up the, the clock, for instance. There it is, there's a clock. I can also, and I can now look at any of these signals inside the chip or or, or its IOs. So there's this um, register inside the processor. It's called instruction latch, and it literally just contains whatever instruction the processor is executing right now. So you can see the actual instruction sequence um, that's being executed it changes every few clock cycles as it fetches the next instruction. <clears throat> I can look at the memory bus as well. I can look at um, what it's presenting on the output pins. I can look if it's currently reading or writing. These are both active low, by the way. Um, these are, this is read enable and write enable. Read enable goes active all the time because there's some fetch instructions. And uh, uh, read enable goes slow all the time. And write enable only goes slow once during the final store instruction when the final test is run. So <clears throat> if, you, if you need to debug your design, you can really dive into every single signal here and find exactly where uh, things went wrong and just step through it yourself while looking at the graphs. Um, although that, that, that's not quite running a, an actual simulation of the chip. Um, this is an RTL simulation, which means I'm basically um, executing the source Verilog as if it was code. Um, I can actually run something called a gate level simulation. This will actually simulate the chip. It will actually take the output of the last build with open lane, and it will simulate every single standard cell. It will basically do a simulation of almost, um, it's almost down to individual transistors. Um, I'm not going to wait for this to finish, by the way. Um, <clears throat> the, this takes like... Does this, um, does this, um, take, take into account like the delays in the wires and stuff? Like, yes, uh, it does. Everyone. It does, because Verilog supports that. that there's a beautiful uh, thing of uh, in Verilog syntax. I'll just pull this up again. If I, if I just open up the... Uh, the source for this again, right there. Um, there's, a, there's a thing you can do in Verilog, uh, which is your, just the latency operator. It's just a hashtag and a number. This means this is a delay. It 
basically means between everything before this and everything after this introduce a one nanosecond delay. And so you can use this to actually to actually simulate gate delays um, when running a, a low level simulation. Which, by the way, I'm not going to wait for this to finish. It takes like 10 gigabytes of RAM and takes 45 minutes. Um, so I guess at this point, if anybody has any questions, now's the time. I don't have anything more to say, I think. Okay. <laughs> well, first, just a round of applause, and thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry, someone's been sorry for the very, very scuffed beginnings. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is um, good. I can pass the mic if anyone has questions. So. Oh, wait, I think... Uh, uh, wait. You want... You can okay. So my question was, can the simulation also simulate analog circuits or does it only work for digital circuits? Um, as, as I said earlier, the, the process development kit includes models of the, of the, of the uh, production process of the different transistors they can make. Um, just so you can run simulations. Uh, I'm not sure if you were there yet, but I showed a screenshot on a tool called XGEM, which can, which can be used to develop analog circuits, and it can, in its simulations, even account for things like uh, the te physical temperature of the chip and voltage fluctuations. So, yes, you can run incredibly accurate simulations. Wow, that's very cool. Is that how they developed some of the samples you showed? in the previous talk like um well, i guess I like like in the previous talk you should like some examples like dna uh, sequencer and stuff like did they use this tool for that like to, to develop something i assume so um the thing with analog on skywater foundries is that it's not very developed right now the community or the open source tools aren't that far along at x Shem is definitely the, the most mature one, so I, I would assume, I would hope they use that. <clears throat> but currently, people are working on automated flows for analog also. Um, people are working on more different uh, ways to actually design analog circuits. Um, right now, it's kind, of, it's kind of a little bit like the Wild West right now in analog, where a lot of stuff still needs to be made slash discovered. Do you have a question? Do you yes. Know? I do. Ah. I just realized that's one more slide in my presentation. But I'll leave that until so, I have questions. My question is like, if you make a complex uh, design, is it worth more like running constantly the simulation than actually simulating on an FPG? Or there is an advantage or disadvantage in like speed or time point? <coughs> Here's the thing, even if you have an FPGA, you still want to run the simulations. FPGAs behave very, very differently from integrated circuits in some cases, because FPGAs kind of cheat. They use lookup tables to look up um, a lot of the solutions to the, to the logic um, that they try to represent, whereas um, um, A6 uh, chips, they actually implement the, the logic physically. So there is a difference between that, and you, so you, you really always want to run the simulations, because, for instance, the latencies are very different. Um, and yes, developing um, chips is a lot of just waiting for simulations to finish. Um, um, especially in, in the late stage um, with the, the Commodore SID replica that I'm trying to, to make. Um, the very last test I wanted to run is um, having it play an entire tune in the simulations, which meant simulating several minutes of activity, which ended up taking um, four IRL days to complete. Um, so, yeah, it, it, lots of simulations. Any, any more questions? Mm. Mm, if not, then... Uh, if well, not, I will move on to... If not, I will move on to my final proposition uh, for this oh, yes. presentation. There's one more thing that I would like to show. This is... Oh, hold on, wait for it. 
this is a chip that I'm designing that is not a singular thing, but a submission of multiple designs. I call it TM box, which stands for Fallen's Miscellaneous Box of Circuits. And you can see that it has a bunch of separate designs on it. And the chip has some address lines on the output. You can question. select which one of these designs actually gets question. exposed to the external IOs. Um, right. Do you see that one at the bottom right? The very dull square. That is the actual size of that that state oh, bit processor that right. I just built during the demo. So you can implement some really, really complex stuff in one of these chips, or you can implement a lot of small things. And I think one of the most fun things you can do is to a group submission, where you and a couple of your friends um, get together, you each make your own little design, and wire it all up together in one chip and submit it. Um, because the, the Kind of is this expectation of the free shuttles that you do submit something reasonably complex um, or something with a lot of designs in it. Um, so my proposal for this is if anybody feels, if anybody here at all feels like they want to get started with making their own chips but don't think they can make like an entire quad-core processor or something yet, um, just, just join me. This is a, um, a multi-project submission. Um, if you DM me, I can reserve some space for you. Um, there's some really simple designs on here as well. Um, there's one, on, there's a couple of them that are, are just my tiny tape out two submissions. Again, they, they, one of those designs is literally a one-bit processor, um, and another of them is it's just scrolling some text on an LCD. So there's no lower limit to complexity when you're when you're doing things as a group. So if you feel like at all you're interested in making your own chips, just DM me, and I can reserve some space in this for you. But, yeah, that's my final proposal for this. Um, yes. I think that's it. Yeah, um, actually, um, Are we in time? I have more question. Okay, sure. Do I just hold it? Yeah. Yes. Or, oh, uh, I wanted to ask if uh, all this stuff works also on Windows, or is it, or is it just Linux only? Thank you. I don't know. Um, it depends on how well Docker works with Windows subsystem for Linux. If it works. If it works then at all, then I think this is possible. This, this is possible, but uh, there are a couple people in the um, um, open source Silicon Slack using Windows, trying to get their tools to work under the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, but all I ever see is people complaining about it not working. But at the same time, that might also be survivorship bias because the people that do get it to work wouldn't talk about it in the chat. So I don't know. I, th I, I don't know how your mileage may be with uh, getting it to work under Windows. You would just have to try. <clears throat> so if there's a uh, normal question on and we're more on the first result. You almost crashed there. What did you Sorry? You were gone oh, for like I was gone for like several seconds. Oh, I was say <laughs> if there's no more question then because it's uh thanks for calling again for the talk. Um, picture talk. Picture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, like, uh, <laughs> you can ask him if you are interested in doing his projects or DM him, as he said. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming as well. Um, Help us actually, actually, actually throw something want, together as well. If you want, we can take a, we can take a group picture as well. Uh, I'll play with the club big. We'll fit on the stage stuff. though. Uh, mm -hmm. Um. Also, you're right, God. <laughs> may, 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 Stay may, maybe I'll take down this this stage because, like, I don't think we all fit here. Stuff happening. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. Quite a lot of people. Frick. But like, yeah, we can we can all come here and we can take a group picture and then you're just free to hang around it's or, a, or whatever. A task. <laughs> It's, it's way bo way above my uh, ability to comprehend. <laughs> no, it fits totally into my into my studies. 
but it's... I could pause the picture. Oh hey, the gate level simulation finished! Wow. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I, I guess you can also take a picture and after that you can cut the stream. But... Yeah. Oh, Wait. oh, the microphone disappears as well, right? <laughs> Okay, hey, you take encounter if you want as well. I mean, if you want. Here we go. Okay. One. I think two, everyone is in the smile, frame. Whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Hang on, one more. Let me show everyone's there. Alright, very good. Lift your hands up there in the air. Show some love. And here it goes. <laughs> and, yeah. I really hope my audio was better this time. I, uh... Oh, it was much better. Yeah, it was much better. I got it. Thank mm. you. Aki, thank you. Oh wait, did you wanna join the secret <laughs> pick? Just <laughs> someone just arrived. <laughs> yeah, you can join. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. 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 my tracking break. <laughs> oh no. The person that just came in, can you move to your right? More. Right, right, right. Some people are like errors for me. I don't know why. Some things up with your chat. Oh. All right, here we go. Well, yeah, we are just we are just right. Right. Oh, a new right. version. Top shot. Mm. Healing down. Anybody I... else wants to do a picture? Are they like thing? I've got it. I. I. Thank you. New version has been okay. deep. Do I cut the stream? Uh, yeah, you can do that. Okay. I know that the presentation is over. I'm once again gonna turn this into my gaming stream. going to put this whole synthesizer on a VR chat shader. What was that? I'm lagging really badly. <laughs> Wait, what version is that? It's beta 1.7.3. <laughs> 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 